Hello there, and welcome to this week's Concept Map presentation. I'm Dr. Liam Highland, and today we will briefly be covering the etiology of and approach to managing epistaxis. Epistaxis is common and usually self-limiting or controllable with basic measures, but in some cases it can be life-threatening. Although in most cases the cause is not known, it is important to consider the possible etiology. We can think about causative factors as either local to the nose or systemic. Local factors include trauma such as picking the nose, anterior trauma to the face or surgery to the nose, acute sinonasal infection, chronic inflammatory disease such as uh, GPA, neoplasms uh, which can be either benign or malignant or drugs. Systemic factors uh, include intrinsic bleeding disorders such as haemophilia or uh, von Willebrand's disease, acquired bleeding disorders due to liver or renal disease or haematological malignancy, antiplatelet or anticoagulant medications, uh, more drugs of which in relation to these are on the next slide, uh, vascular abnormalities such as HHT, also known as osler weber rendu syndrome, or due to mucosal changes that occur during pregnancy. As a side note, hypertension is often detected during acute epistaxis due to anxiety or pain secondary to nasal packing, but may not necessarily be a direct cause. As mentioned, epistaxis can be caused by drugs administered either locally or systemically. Locally administered drugs such as antihistamines or decongestants can dry out the nasal mucosa or cause local trauma with application. Inhaled drugs such as cocaine are also harmful to the nasal mucosa. Of the causative, systemically administered medications, antiplatelets and anticoagulants are the most frequent culprits. Anatomically, we can consider nosebleeds as originating anteriorly or posteriorly within the nose. The nasal mucosa itself is highly vascularized due to its role in humidifying and warming the air we breathe. It is supplied by both the internal and external carotid arteries. Most nosebleeds are anterior and tend to occur within the area of the anterior septal wall where terminal branches and astomose, known as Kieselbach's plexus or Little's area. The focus or uh, bleeding point can be seen on anterior rhinoscopy uh, if bleeding is not too severe. And usually it's treatable with conservative measures of first aid, compressing the nostrils or beyond this nasal cautery. Epistaxis in children is usually anterior as well. Posterior epistaxis is less common and more likely to occur in adults. It can be arterial or venous from Woodruff's area, uh, the venous plexus, venous plexus situated uh, in the posterior aspect of the nasal cavity. Posterior bleeding focal points require an endoscope to visualize and within the acute setting are more likely to require invasive treatment with nasal packing or beyond that surgery. This guideline here is how we should approach those suffering with epistaxis. With most clinical presentations, we start by thinking of all the possible causes and then categorize the differential diagnoses. With a thorough history and clinical findings from examining our patients, we can then conclude the most likely cause of illness and proceed with subsequent management. However, in practice, the cause of epistaxis itself is often unknown and bar a few exceptions such as HHT, the approach to initial management is the same. So at this flowchart outlines the treatment algorithm for epistaxis at our hospital. Blue, blocks, blue boxes represent outpatient management, green inpatient and red specialist management requiring senior ENT decision making. Black boxes show decision points where bleeding control is checked. Arrows point to the next steps. Uh, black show if bleeding is controlled and red arrow if not controlled. To examine the nose, nasal cavity is cleared with careful suction, plus or minus forceps, uh, which can be used if there is presence of blood clots. A topical vasoconstrictor with local anesthetic can also be applied, such as cofenocaine, and often this can be soaked in cotton wool uh, balls and applied directly to the nasal cavity. Within the outpatient setting, if there's an anterior bleeding point visualized, and this can be treated with nasal cautery, either chemical cautery with silver nitrate or electrocautery if this is available. If low volume bleeding or no specific bleeding points are seen, then bioreabsorbable nasopacking material can be applied. 
In both cases, the patient is discharged with topical antibiotic, such as naceptin or bactrobin cream, or topical Vaseline cream for a period of one week. In acute epistaxis, as with all acute bleeding, ABC resuscitation methods should be followed initially. Apply basic first aid by compressing the soft part of the nose whilst tilting the head forward and breathing through the mouth for at least 15 to 20 minutes without releasing. Most, bleeds, most nosebleeds themselves are treatable with proper first aid. If bleeding is not controlled over this time, the nose is prepped and anterior bleeding uh, point cauterized as described previously. However, if this fails or the bleeding itself is too profuse and cannot be assessed properly, then anterior nasal packing is performed. And depending upon the local policy, the patient is um, admitted to the inpatient ward. If unilateral anterior packing is not successful, then bilateral anterior packing can be uh, performed and to achieve bilateral compression of the septum itself. Failing this, posterior packing with a Foley catheter and ribbon gauze or BIPP is performed. Packs themselves are removed after a period of 24 to 48 hours, uh, upon which then the nasal cavity can then be inspected again and any bleeding point can be cauterized and patients then subsequently discharged with topical treatment and appropriate safety netting advice. If the bleeding persists despite nasal packing, then surgery under general anesthesia, such as uh, SPA ligation, which refers to sphenopalatine artery ligation, uh, or anterior ethmoidal artery ligation, if traumatic, uh, both of which, uh, most of these can be considered. Further surgery or embolization procedures can also be considered for patients in whom initial surgical intervention was unsuccessful. This presentation's purpose is to guide your thinking process when you encounter a patient with epistaxis. The presentation itself is not meant to be a tool that you use to diagnose or treat your patients with, and you will need to exercise clinical judgment and consider the clinical context of your patient's presentation to make an accurate diagnosis and subsequent treatment. Once again, I'd like to remind you that we do not recommend you to memorize these concept maps. Instead, we hope that through these concept maps, you will learn the process of diagnostic reasoning, the ability to critically examine a list of differentials and then rank them according to the likelihood and pick up which of these do not fit. Using these examples, read some symptom to diagnosis books and create your own concept maps for each symptom. Thank you very much for listening.